Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Tactical Magic. This is Molly Mandelberg, your host, and I'm excited for the conversation we're about to have today because I think it's been on a lot of people's minds the last few years, but mental health, how we speak to ourselves, how we speak to other people is definitely on the forefront of my mind and I know a lot of my clients' minds and I have an expert here today to help navigate that discussion with me. It's not just about mastering technology. It's not just about brand or messaging. It's not just about making more money. It's about showing up in a big way so your people can find you. This is about bringing your most wild and authentic self into the hustle and grind. Welcome to Tactical Magic, a business strategies podcast for the warrior goddess entrepreneur. Layla Okai is the founder and CEO of Diverse Minds, enabling organizations to create mentally healthy and equal workplaces through coaching, training, speaking, and consultancy. With a focus on practical mental health strategies, cultural awareness, and race equality to facilitate a positively productive workplace. Layla has over 17 years experience in developing and implementing diversity, inclusion, and equality practices, primarily by working closely with senior leadership teams. She has been responsible for embedding culture change and moving vital agendas forward. Welcome to the show, Layla. Molly, thank you so much for having me. It's such a delight to be speaking with you today. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you here. So tell us a little bit about your journey to doing the work that you're doing now. So it's an interesting journey. And I think given the work that you do and the spiritual entrepreneurs, I never thought I'd have my own business. So I wasn't one of these people that um, woke up and uh, knew from the age of six that, yes, I'm going to have my own business. In fact, I really pushed against it because my many people in my family had their own businesses. They had um, quite a large uh, turnover in terms of shops and fabric shops, etc. So my business, I always say, kind of found me. Um, I was doing work at Imperial College London, primarily around mental health in the workplace getting staff to understand their own mental well-being and supporting other staff as managers or as colleagues Um, and as part of that work it was quite innovative at the time so this was around 2012 2013 2014 um, and other universities and institutions in the UK started hearing about what I was doing and they said oh okay that's really interesting oh my gosh how did you get your management on board how did you do this would you come and talk to us yeah sure come and talk to oh actually could you come and do some training for us and I spoke to my manager she said you can go and do it but what you'll need to remember is that that money that you get needs to go into the departmental budget I said fine and I'd use that for team away days and then it kept happening and I thought hmm okay this is interesting and I bought annual leave extra vacation days um, and then it kept happening and I thought well okay there's clearly something in this I, I never in a million years would have thought this was a business idea and that's that's kind of been my journey and I think I was very lucky that I had many contacts many colleagues networks people that promoted me um, and that's how I've been running my business for four and a half years so yeah an interesting one around destiny and fate for me, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's probably a lot of people that can resonate with that. And what I want to highlight what I'm seeing and what's the same for my own story is you started doing something you were passionate about, something that you had an innate gift for or an interest in. And by following that curiosity and just doing it one step at a time, it became your vocation. So Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people out there think, oh, I need to figure out what it is. And that will make me money and then start moving that direction and really going to what you care most about and just digging into that Mm -hmm. sort of desire, that passion for it, it might accidentally become something. And that was the same true for my story as well. I just had a business as a hypnotherapist, wasn't quite sure what I was doing. And I was like super dedicated to figuring out this online marketing thing. And then I just got good at that by geeking out on it and realized there were people that needed my help with that. So just started letting my friends hire me. So I just like to ask that question at the beginning, because I think a lot of people out there are like, gosh, this is such a confusing, meandering, wandering, wandering (laughs) journey. And I think that's true for everybody who makes it as an entrepreneur. Well, for many of us, that it's not a, I had an idea and wrote a business plan and started moving towards it and just created this thing. It's like, no, I accidentally... (laughs) did something I loved. And then look, it turned into something that really helps people. Yeah, 
absolutely because I in fact when I did a business accelerator program just before I, le I leapt from my full-time job and um, they were they were great actually they didn't force us to do business plans they made us do sort of lean canvases but I just think business I've never had a business plan <laughs> <laughs> I've had I have a one page plan where I am now where I want to get to my values and what, how I'm going to do it and I, some of the feedback I got from business people was oh what, the, you've given yourself a big to-do list it's, and it's like well you don't get this then because yeah. I just need a page on a plan I need something that I can clearly see my bullet points that I can aim for but I'm not going to spend hours and hours writing a 40 page document that's going to I don't know do what stress me out or sit somewhere or make me feel uh, accountable or beholden actually it is a better way to express that so yes, I, I completely hear you on that one. Yeah, totally. I like that. I like the idea of having one page cheat sheet too of like, this is what my vision is. I tend to do that from time to time with when I have a new project I want to bring to life. I try mm -hmm. to make a picture of how it's going to fit into my business. Um, but I love that. So tell us a little bit about how those trainings go, how those experiences are. What are you showing up and bringing to the table that those people are asking for? Yeah, so I would say that my work is in, I guess I said two main, well, there are a couple of themes, but in terms of mental health and well-being, it, the training I do, I'm not a qualified psychotherapist, counsellor, mental health practitioner. I've never worked in healthcare. So I never, ever pretend that I know that. And people who do that work, absolutely. And they have, they, they do different work to what I do. So my work's very much around, okay, how are we defining mental health and wellness as opposed to illness? Um, people will have existing mental ill health conditions as diagnosed by a, a medical professional and that doesn't mean though that those people can't have fulfilling lives and come to work and be part of the workplace in order to do that though we need to think about the systems and how are the systems serving people who may need adjustments or I know in America you call them accommodations in the workplace and actually these adjustments or accommodations are not difficult to do it might be that someone needs to work 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock it might be that they need to go to a medical appointment don't make them make up the time respect them and respect that and I think that sounds like a very it shouldn't be a radical idea but sadly it comes across as a very radical idea um, and just having a conversation saying look not giving advice not saying that you know everything but just to say you know what when you're ready to talk I'm here to listen and upskilling managers with those tools and also being really mindful about where to draw the boundaries because what often happens is you get managers that are like no you can't have anything and then you get managers that want to do everything and unfortunately they're desperately trying to help but they can become an emotional emotional crutch. So it's where do we find that balance of support and structure and boundaries, um, realizing what's within your own limits. And then thinking about race and culture and how race and culture play a part. And we all have an ethnicity, every single one of us, and we all have a culture and exploring that and unpicking that and thinking about if I were, what, what, what is it from my culture that helps my mental wellness? And if I were to become unwell, what are the strategies from my culture and my background that can help my mental wellness journey and workplaces? Okay, it's great if you have things in place like an employee assistance program, an in-house nurse, doctor, whatever it is you have, but how are they thinking about the holistic person? Um, so yes, yeah, coming from those two different angles. Awesome. Do you have any advice for people who might be in a workplace situation like that, who need to advocate for themselves? Like, how do you start that conversation? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question because what, what we find often happens is the person who's experiencing or who has a diagnosis or maybe they don't have a diagnosis, but they're not their mental optimum, have to advocate for themselves. And often in that position, they can be quite unwell at that moment and they can't do it for themselves. So um, a couple of things I would say, think about who your supporters are in the workplace and outside of the workplace. Um, again, I know in the US it's different uh, depending on where you work, but in the UK, we still do have trades unions, your trade union representatives representative can support you um, and sometimes it's not you might not be able to bring an advocate but most workplaces in the US and the UK um, will say you can bring a supportive person into a meeting um, and I think workplaces really need to be aware that life isn't linear I mean who spends a hundred percent of their life feeling mentally optimum every single day of their life that's just unrealistic you know it could be from yeah from a divorce relationship breakdown um, you might be thrilled to be having a baby but you may experience post depression you may have lost a child and and grieving and dealing with that caring for elderly parents or caring for parents they may not even be elderly so all of these things we know go on in everyone's lives 
Um, so it's being realistic about it. And also, I think, yes, we, we, we care about productivity, but we need to stop obsessing over it. And if we show some compassion and care, then that's going to help people to be productive. So I think for the individual, it's remember, this isn't a sign of weakness. This is completely normal. Um, now, it may not, you may not be made to feel like it's normal because everyone might feel they're putting on their mask and it might feel like they're okay. Why am I not okay? Mm. So check in on your resources, have a look on wherever you find strength. Is that podcast? Is that music? Is that reading? Is that radio? Um, and remember who can be your supporter in the workplace, who can be that person that could advocate for you if they can't advocate for you. Can they sit next to you while you have these conversations? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important what you just said to recognize that everybody's putting on a face to go to work usually, and that it's very possible that more people are in a similar boat to you dealing with things under the surface or behind the scenes that we know nothing about, which is a great reason to just be a compassionate individual with everyone you're dealing with in general, but also especially in the workplace. And I think that's one of the things we're starting to see more of, I mean, in the last probably decade or so, like the culture that we know about in the Google workplace where there's like so much more play and fun and creativity and more, I think, caring for employees needs than the traditional hustle and grind kind of workplace, which I'm sure there's still hustle and grind in Google, <laughs> but um, that it's possible to get more out of your team when you support them more rather than trying to run everybody ragged to like squeeze the juice of work out of them. So I really like that that is at the forefront of what you're doing. And also just that message in general to the world that it, you can actually create greater and more, and maybe even be more productive if you allow yourself to be cared for and you allow mm -hmm. yourself to take time for you. Um, that the pause is as like, as energy producing as just trying, it's more energy producing than just trying to go, go, go and create, create, create. And I think that's an imp important message for entrepreneurs as well, that, you know, we say mm. you'll work 80 hours a week for yourself to avoid working 40 hours a week for somebody else. <laughs> like, okay, but where are you taking so care of yourself? How are you filling your own cup so that you can go out and produce great things for yourself? <clears throat> So do you have any, I mean, what are your own practices for keeping yourself in the game or taking care of your own mental health? Yeah, and I've really, really had to think about this very carefully in more depth over the last two years. So at the beginning of the pandemic, um, so we went on lockdown in the UK, I think it was the 17th of March 2020, and my work disappeared overnight. And I was really excited about that work that I had planned because it was a lot of speaking events at exciting conferences and they, they've never sort of come back. And then it just went through this resurgence and it was nonstop. So I think one of the things that I'd like to do is to record my hours. And it's not to say oh, I'm working 80 hours a week, but to say, okay, what, what is actually going on here and I had a, a sense that you know am I doing too much work and actually I wasn't um, so that was really useful because it was thinking well why am I feeling this way so what what is it that's happening if I'm feeling like I'm working all the time but I, technically I'm not um, something something's not right here um, so that's one thing. Another thing is I really love reading. Reading is a massive escapism for me. So even if I just read for 10 minutes a day, um, I try and make it longer. I, I love it. Mixture of books, mixture of things, including audio books. So going for a walk with an audio book, listening. I love all of that. Um, and then just daily yoga practice as well. So, you know, I don't, I'm not saying that I'm one of these Ashtanga people that does loads of fitness yoga, but just even if it's 10 minutes a day, um, sometimes it's just a yoga nidra, sometimes it's meditation but I find when I don't do those things that my mental health dips very very significantly um, and yeah that's that's the thing that really grounds me and helps me to keep going and that's the thing isn't it Molly when we don't do we might think our practices seem small but when we stop doing them gosh does it hit us in terms of the impact and and the and the gap in our lives yeah absolutely I've had periods of time where I'm a regular meditator and periods of time where I just forget or don't do don't make time for it and it's true with exercise as well and my own journaling practice, which is like my biggest daily mental health check-in. Um, and my life is dramatically different on days I don't do those mm -hmm. practices. Every single one of them enhances my life so much because I've noticed the difference of doing it versus not doing it. It's sort of like this experiment. I think all of us need to be in the experimentation of in our lives. Like notice, maybe try meditating for 10 minutes a day for a week 
see what your life is like, and then go back to not doing it for a week and see what your life is like. And notice if that's the thread that last week was a little bit better or lighter or more enjoyable, or, Mm -hmm. you know, you had your head on straight, you were less reactive. That might be something worth doing every day. And I love that you mentioned it, you know, even if it's just 10 minutes of reading that it takes you to another world where you're not consumed by the work that needs to be done, even if you're not actively doing it right now, that's super important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So I know a lot of your work also focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion or equality and inclusion. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, the important things to be keeping in mind, because I know this is a big topic in the world right now. What are some things for leaders and business owners to be paying attention to or focusing on to keep that at the forefront? Yeah, really great question. And I think one of the things I've really noticed in the UK in the last few months, especially, is the pushback. So there seems to be, and I don't know, you know, how your sense actually, Molly, in the US, but this this pushback around, we're, we're fed up, we've heard enough, Black Lives Matter is done, sick of talking about LGBTQ plus equality. So I think that's one of the challenges. So to flip it on its head and answer your question, I think that the key thing for me is don't see it as a bolt on. So don't see it as a nice little extra to have. And when we've done the profits, uh, we'll then think about that because you can't really untangle the two. We've talked about productivity. We've talked about people being able to uh, feel comfortable at work, have these conversations. So how can you separate the two? Because we know if our people are happy, we have higher retention, we have lower recruitment costs, we have people being more productive and that all drives a profit up. Um, and it's obvious and there's tons written on it. You know, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not an academic. I don't write about this. There's tons in the Harvard Business Review, there's tons in Forbes. This is well known, but yet common sense and research methodology doesn't seem to be common practice. So please don't go, oh yes, we'll do diversity next year, or we're doing race this year, we're going to do disability next year, because how can you untangle them in a sense? It's really thinking about the holistic person and also to think about, I think my company's great. What's my lens? Okay. If I wasn't from my lens, what could the barriers be for other people from different lenses? And I think that's the way to think about it as opposed to, okay, let's do the tick box. Oh God, look at what they're doing over there. Oh, okay. What are they doing? Let's look at the horizon. No, focus on what is going well. You have your data, you'll have your gaps, stop overanalyzing, but do think about the emotion and the feeling around it and lean into the discomfort. This is not comfortable work and it's not meant to be comfortable. If you don't experience discomfort and you go to the nice women's lunches and hand out awards for gender equity, that's lovely. But if you're not feeling discomfort, you're not creating change. And if you're not creating change, what's the point? Mm. <laughs> that was a tweetable right there. For sure. Yeah. Yes. And so just to, to add to that, I mean, the lens thing is so important to look at, okay, this is the lens that I'm seeing my business through for those of us on the line who are entrepreneurs this is the lens I'm seeing my business through, like, here is my brand, here's my messaging to sort of try on a different lens and say, if I was this person, how would I receive this? And I think it's really challenging. I mean, of course it is because we've been not aware that we're looking through a certain lens through our entire lives that we get so used to it. We think this is just how the world is, but to recognize that you have a different point of view, a different lens through which you're seeing the world then it might be a stretch and it might be uncomfortable to say, let me look at my website or let me look at my marketing tactics through the lens of somebody who has walked a very different life than me. How would I receive this? Would this be offensive? Would this be like, would this speak to me in the same way? And do you have any advice for how to maybe either try on that new lens or to you know, speak a different language in a better way. Yeah, I think um, in the, so we're very fortunate, aren't we, in the entrepreneurial community, we can reach out to people quite quickly, we can go on LinkedIn, we can join groups, we can ask questions, we can go on Facebook, so we can get some surface level detail there. I'd also think about your entrepreneurial network. So, you know, if you're a spiritual net, you know, spiritpreneur, um, you can do that too. You can say, look, you know what, I'm really open to feedback. I don't want to create work for more people. If you want to signpost me to influencers, people you listen to, I want to go and have a look. If anyone's willing to have a mastermind with me, you can offer something um, in return. Like, come and come and look. I'm really open to this feedback. And what I really want to do is, you know, if you have a visual impairment, is is my website? Would you come to me? What what do I need to do? What do I need to do to get those barriers down? So I think we're very fortunate, and we can be very agile as well. So we don't have to spend two years creating a committee. We can put something out there quite quickly and get that feedback. And just remembering, you know, the reciprocity. So we need to give something as well. 
well because we are asking people potentially to open up to be quite vulnerable to us to share their lens so w- what are we going to give back as well um, and just being really open to, to, to that and thinking okay so what is the standpoint that I've done this from and maybe you feel like okay I'm, I can't cater to certain groups all right that's fine but have you explored that and I think that's the key and maybe talking about what you've explored how you've explored it why you've not explored it why you know it's all those things and 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 really implementing because I don't think these things are difficult actually I think people think they're more difficult than they actually are um you know the hard thing is to, to take the leap and set up a business in a way and I know it doesn't stay it doesn't stay still we know that it moves it's not stagnant so use that as an opportunity to say okay if I've got I've got my kaleidoscope how do I want to turn my kaleidoscope so I see different colors um and please don't see it as burdensome burdensome see it as an activity to network and share and be a part of something bigger that's a great perspective shift for sure. This isn't another to do on your list. This is a way to expand your community and to grow as a person and a leader for sure. I love that. Um, so tell us a little bit about the, I know you have a course that you have for people. Tell us a little bit about that. So um, one of my lockdown projects was I created an online course called The Mentally Healthy Professional. And it's for anyone who is trying to figure out their work-life balance blend. And so for some of us, 70% work may be absolutely right. For others of us, it might be 40% or 20% work and the 80% we want to do different things. Um, So there's four modules in it. And the first one is about, um, it's all online. There's videos, there's cheat sheets, there's downloadables. uh, Also there are resources in there. So the first is about where is my work-life balance? now where do I want it to be Uh, the second module is all about what's draining my time where's my time and energy going Um, the fourth module the third module sorry is all about okay what 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 kinds of activities put me in different zones and mood frames and how can I get more of that and the final module is all about assertiveness and self-care so what does assertiveness mean if we don't feel comfortable saying no can we say not yet Um, how do we want to create those boundaries for ourselves for our mental well-being and keep track of them I like that the ping attention to how that becomes a regular thing. Going to yoga one time or having dinner with a friend one time isn't going to create that work-life balance. But if you start to integrate those habits and those changes into your life on a regular basis, this is a silly tip, but I make everything that's self-care or that's like soul filling yellow on my calendar. So if I see a week on my calendar as I'm scrolling that has no yellow on it, I'm like, "Uh oh, I need to take better care of myself this week. Um, it's like a silly mind hack, but it definitely works. It does work. Mine's sage green. So there we go. go. (laughs) Awesome. So what else do you want to make sure that people know? I mean, you've shared a lot of wisdom on this podcast, but you know, what's your heart calling you to share more of? Yeah. So, so many things. And it's again, for me, and I'm saying all this stuff, it's, it's the time, isn't it? But just, yeah, I mean, I'd love to, I love hearing from people. So, you know, again, thank you, Molly, for the platform. And it's been wonderful to talk to you. If you are interested, my, you know, my podcasts are very much from a UK focus. If anyone wants to know more about snippets around South Asian diaspora in the UK, Okay, or what's what's kind of going down in the UK around equality, inclusion, and mental well-being? Then do check out my podcast. I love hearing from listeners. You know, I've got blogs on my website, um, and I'm actually working on a. I'm trying to work on a set of conversation cards around making space for race. Um, so how we can and leaning leaning into that discomfort and what that might look like. So I can't give you a release date because I don't know. But um, keep your eyes peeled. Yeah. Well, tell us the name of your podcast. So it's a Diverse Minds podcast, and you can find it on on all the platforms where you would probably listen to podcasts, but I'm not on YouTube. So um, yes. (laughs) Diverse Minds Podcast. And where could people follow you on social media? Are you on there? Yeah. So on Facebook, it's at Diverse Minds UK. On Twitter, the handle is at Diverse Minds UK. And on LinkedIn, it's my name. So L-E-Y-L-A-O-K-H-A-I. And also I have a Diverse Minds business page. Awesome. So definitely go and follow all those places and check out that online course and what get on whatever list you can get on so that you are the first to hear about that deck that's coming out, those cards. That sounds awesome. I made an Oracle deck a few years ago. That's been a fun game. It's not as purposeful as yours, but it's kind of fun. That's a fun game to get to bring out and show people and play with. And it's a great conversation starter. So I think that'll be an awesome project for you. Um, And yeah, I usually ask this question at the end of every show, even though you shared a lot of wisdom already. Are there any last words of wisdom that you want to leave people with? I've been thinking a lot about this, actually. So I'll I'll share it just about how we uh, shift and it's really obvious. We know that we shift and 
not necessarily change, but our priorities shift and to just go along with it. So for me, um, you know, I was, I think I still am somewhere, but an extreme extrovert. And everyone said to me, oh my goodness, how are you going to cope with lockdown? And actually I've had, I wouldn't say a transformation, but a, a moment where I, I think, you know, what? I don't have to be around people all the time. I can sit with myself. I can sit with solitude much better than I thought I could. So I suppose it's going with that transition and realize that you have that resilience and you have that strength in you um, and how you want to nurture that. And sometimes the circumstances can push you towards something. Um, I wouldn't have necessarily, you know, I would absolutely Absolutely not say, oh yes, the pandemic was great. It, you know, it's not, and it continues to be the case. But um, what are the things that I've learned about myself that I never thought I could do? So going back to your original point around businesses and people thinking I can't do that, um, you can do it, and you can do it in a way that works for you. You can, and there's support out there in many different forms to help you do that. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show, Layla. I feel like we've all learned a lot from you and just the way that you are showing up in the world and sharing your wisdom and, you know, helping other people to find something that works better for them and helping companies and businesses to cater to the needs of their people in a bigger way is really inspiring and such important work. So thank you for doing that. And thank you, Molly. And thank you for all the work that you do in your podcast and the way in which you embrace entrepreneurship and spirituality. So it's so, it's so valued and it's so beautiful to see. Oh, thank you. Awesome. And thank you everyone out there for listening. This has been another episode of Tactical Magic. We will be back next week with another episode. And whatever happens, keep asking big questions and taking bold action because you are here for a reason. Have a good day. 